This episode of the Creep Street Podcast is brought to you by Martini Coffee Roasters. You know, people always look at me weird when I say I start off every morning with a big old martini. But then I set them straight and I tell them I'm talking about Martini Coffee Roasters Coffee. A delicious coffee made by the Martini family. They roast their coffee using a traditional method of sight and sound to roast those little babies to perfection. And they also sell green coffee beans for those home roasters out there. And right now, fans of the Creep Street podcast can get 20% off their entire order by using the code CREEPSTREET at martinicoffee.com. Once again, for 20% off your order, use the code CREEPSTREET at martinicoffee.com. Martini Coffee Roasters, the perfect coffee to keep you creeps caffeinated. You've taken a wrong turn. Down Creek Street. Of the Milky Way, I'm Maureen Bogey. And I'm Dylan Hackworth. And you are listening to the Creep Street Podcast. We thank you so much for joining us today. We are going to be in for one hell of a ride. Oh, yeah. If you'd like to keep up on what we're doing, feel free to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Creep Street Podcast, Twitter at Creep Street Pod. And also, please, we, if you enjoy our show, please like, rate, subscribe. Tell a friend about us. Share us on social media. These little things, they add up. They really help the show. And we just appreciate it so much. And we're, we're grateful for all that you do for the Creep Street Homeowners Association, the Creep Street community. Oh, yeah. We also have a subgroup on our Facebook called Citizens of the Milky Way. Just a little area where anyone can talk and, you know, share memes, articles, funny things, spooky things. It's just a great time over there. So feel free to just click to be invited. And we we will accept you into our little world. Oh, yeah. Also, if one episode a week is not enough and for you. It's not. It's not. Get, it just quit isn't. lying to yourself. It's not. You need to treat yourself, okay? This is literally self-care. This isn't just self-care. This is this is preventative medicine. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay? And it's on patreon.com slash creepstreetpodcast. We have anything ranging from just small little quick check-ins with us to full-blown oh, yeah. bonus episodes, movies commentaries really so many different things so feel free to check that out and we will hear about and hear the glorious names of our top tier donors after the program that's right stick around at the end of the show we are going to utter those golden names that's right baby now last week was a crazy one. Oh yeah we have we have received a lot of great feedback oh, a lot man. of the cindy james story just catches the imagination so it much does. it's just like it's crazy this week also very scary spooky kooky even oh yeah but in a very different way from cindy james i'm very excited dylan suck it to me what the actual heck is going on today we are talking about the grinning man can't wait to find out about this guy oh he's a real son of a bitch and we will find out about him in a minute real quick let me give you my sources i I read an excellent book called the complete guide to mysterious beings by john keel and then also i will be reading the smiling man it was a creepy pasta story created by a reddit user named blue title i got that from the creepy pasta wiki terrifying story I'm so excited for this. This is like, this is peak paranormal oh, world. You know, and we, the, I'm excited that we're really diving into this because this is going to open the door oh, yeah. for so many other things that we haven't even touched upon yet right. on Creep Street Podcast. And this man, John Keel, who wrote the book that is our main source this week, very much an icon in the paranormal world. Oh, yeah. And I'm just super jazzed to just get going and find out who this man is. All right. Well, let's get to going. Okay. Now, this subject, as you said, very unique subject. I first heard of The Grinning Man a number of years back, and I I loved the story, but I always assumed that it was kind of like something that was just created on internet forums, like Slender Man. Right, right. I kind of, I just thought it was like, wouldn't it be scary if there was a man that just had a big smile on his face? Right. And that was kind of it. That would be scary. Right. I thought it started as like an online thing that kind of grew into an urban legend, like, like I said, but I apparently know. This guy has been spotted around a long time. So it's like more of maybe like 
a cryptid maybe Ooh. or we'll it's see, we'll get a little into bit it. of everything okay. and you're okay. going to see why okay. 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 much like the show the grinning man is a little bit of everything oh he overlaps with many phenomena that we've already talked about so for example the grinning man is often associated with the mothman oh men in black and you'll see as we get into it, uh, there's other interesting wow. connections with Black Eyed Kids even, the shad- uh, the Hat Man, Shadow wow. People. And you're going to see a lot of that in this story. Okay, so once again, this is not just some kind of spooky idea. Like it's, it is connecting with UFOs. It's connecting with interdimensional oh, yeah. things. Like it's connecting with the whole gosh darn gamut for Christ's sakes. Absolutely. And it's even, there's even a little bit of black eyed kids in there right. as well. So that's, so that's like, I don't right. know what you would consider that just paranormal activity in general. I mean, yeah, this is wild. So our story begins on October 11th, 1966 in New Jersey. A policeman and his wife, they were out and about near their home in the town of Popton Lakes, when all of a sudden in the sky they saw a bright light, a blazing white object. Later they would estimate it was probably about the size of a car. Oh, God. And it was just like racing across the sky, and it seemed to almost hit this TV tower. It was about 550 feet tall. It looked like it almost hit it. Mm. And they watched this light as it crossed the sky and then vanished over the hills into the distance. Oh, my God. Well, on the other side of those hills were two on-duty police officers. Sergeant Benjamin Thompson and Patrolman Edward Wester of the Wanaku Reservoir Police It was about 9.45 p.m. when they saw this bright light in the sky. And it seemed to almost intelligently swoop down right above the reservoir and go across it. Sergeant Thompson was quoted saying this. The light was brilliantly white. It lit up the whole area for about 300 yards. In fact, it blinded me when I got out of the patrol car to look at it, and I couldn't see for about 20 minutes afterwards. Wow. Well, that doesn't even sound like any kind of light that we Uh, even like have other than just like the sun that's like super bright. You know what I mean? Like it's like to be 300 yards. That's fucking a big space. Oh, yeah. To be lit. To be fucking lit. To be lit. Dude, they're getting wasted. Just kidding. It's bright. At the same time, about 40 miles away was the town of Elizabeth, New Jersey. Funny enough... In the week leading up to October 11th, there had actually been tons of reports of strange lights in the sky that almost seemed to cluster over the New Jersey Turnpike. Hmm. Well, on that night, October 11th, right about this same time when the police were seeing these strange lights in the sky, two boys who lived in Elizabeth were walking home from hanging out. Their names were James Yonkaitis and Martin Manor, which his friends, I guess, called him Mouse. Hell yeah. Well, these two kids, they're walking home. When they come to the corner of 4th Street and New Jersey Street, uh, which is kind of stands parallel to the turnpike, and just to paint a little picture here, that this turnpike, it's elevated very steeply at the sides, and it sort of dips down from the highway to 4th Street. And running all along the street was a very tall wire fence for the obvious purpose of keeping people from going up onto the the highway, Mm, essentially going up on the turnpike and making, you know, causing an accident. Periodically along this fence, there were street lights, bright street lights that would illuminate everything. So just want to paint a little picture for you of the setting. Okay, okay. Right there on that corner was a light lighting up that area, one of these street lights. And that's when something caught James's eye. He looked across the street and he saw what appeared to be a man. James would later say he was the biggest man he'd ever seen. And here's the thing. This man was standing at the fence, but on the opposite side of it. Hmm, okay. And it seemed as though this man was staring at a house that stood across the street. And that's when the man turned his head and looked directly at the boys. Here's a quote from Martin describing that moment. Jimmy nudged me and said, Who's that guy standing behind you? Hmm. I looked around and there he was, behind the fence, just standing there. He pivoted around and looked right at us. And then he grinned, a big old grin. Freaky. Oh, God, that is so fucking scary. I don't like that. Yeah. Really quick. 
Isn't it scary when there's someone smiling like that? Like, oh, it's very just scary. when anyone's smiling in a situation when they should not be smiling, right? Is scary. Well, first of all, how, and the source makes a point of this. How did he get on that side of the fence? Yeah, it, it, they put up a theory. Maybe it was someone who was driving on the turnpike and their car broke down. Mm-hmm. But then, why would he not be saying, "Hey, guys, I need help. Can you call a to-? you know what I right. mean?" Right. Yeah. He's yeah, just yeah. standing staring. there. Yes, and just staring at them and smiling. And it's also weird too. It's like it's not just like a smirk like it's full on like yes. teeth like a toothy you're like really fucking smiling right and it's the source describes it as almost unnaturally big oh that my heart you guys i hate i hate that shit when it's like just that little thing where you're right. like what is th- oh right. my god if this happened to me i couldn't handle it that's all i'm saying it's creepy stuff well three days later the author of the source, John Keel, he interviewed the boys about what they'd seen. In fact, he interviewed them both separately back to back and their stories completely lined up too. He did that just to make sure that just wasn't a just a hoax. Extra you know. precaush, yeah. They both described this strange man as very tall, at the very least six feet tall, very broad shouldered, and he wore what they described as almost like sparkling green coveralls that mm. shimmered and reflected the street light above him. Think almost like a disco ball in a way. It's Dang, it almost reminds me, uh, like it's uh, the way I'm thinking of it, it's like it just reflects all the light, kind of like like a construction worker jacket. Right, right. Or almost, yeah, it's almost like how you would see aliens dressed in like 50s, 60s sci-fi, like really yes. bad. Like With it the- feels like a like a cheesy B-movie suit almost, right, is how like they're a, describing it. And no one wore like jumpsuits at the time. You know, Especially I know, sparkle. I mean, maybe, you know, yeah. obviously there's reason, you know, if you were a mechanic or whatever reason, but like but no it wasn't- one, even if it was someone coming home from work where they yeah, had, you know, when they would have that, they wouldn't be wearing sparkling coveralls. <laughs> yes, y- you like, know what I mean? very odd. Yeah. And around his waist was a wide black belt. They described him as having a very dark complexion with very small round eyes that seemed set too far apart. Oh, fuck. On top of that, they couldn't remember seeing any hair or even ears or even a nose on this guy. This sounds like a fucked up gray alien to me, kind of. Yeah. They also didn't notice any hands, but there was a bunch of brush over there, and they really only saw him kind of from the waist up, so yeah. he could very well have had hands, he just didn't have them up in the air. Right. He probably has long-ass arms. Right, so. right. Well, apparently there had been some violence in the weeks before this in Elizabeth, so the kids didn't stick around. They ran home because right. they were like, hey, I don't know who this, you know, they just don't want to get They're hurt. They're like, we got to go. Strangely enough, this may be unrelated. But apparently that very same night in Elizabeth, New Jersey, a middle-aged man reported to the police that he was chased down the street by a, quote, tall green man. (gasps) What? How weird is that? Wait, that's so bizarre. So, okay, so the guy in, or the, whatever the fuck, in the coveralls, they said he was wearing green coveralls. Right. And this is a green man. Right. It's like, I wonder if maybe, like, that seems like a big coincidence. I know, right? It would be weird if there just happened to be two dudes unrelated that just happened to look like that. Yeah, it's weird. Like, I wonder if maybe, did this man have green skin and maybe it just looked like green coveralls at at the time? Or maybe the person that was being chased, maybe the skin appeared green and that's why they said green or maybe the green coverall you know what i mean it's like i don't know exactly what it was going on but and and also keep in mind it's it's nighttime and they're under a lamp like you you know know, things can look different you know especially if it's not well lit or what right right oh that's so scary though being chased oh god i can't now just a few weeks later on november 6th 1966 it was a rainy wednesday night and a man named woodrow derenberger was driving home Derenberger worked as a traveling sewing machine salesman, and uh, he was driving back from Marietta, Ohio, to his home in Mineral Wells, West Virginia. It was a dark, rainy night, so Derenberger obviously is keeping his eyes locked on the road. He's driving along when all of a sudden something catches his eye. He looks up, and in the sky was an object that Derenberger described as, quote, shaped like the chimney on a kerosene lamp. He sees this thing in the sky, this light. Like a cylindrical Right, and it's like flying above him. When all of a sudden this thing takes a downward turn and lands in the middle of the road (gasps) ahead of him. It gave him enough time to stop, though. Of course, Derenberger slams on (gasps) the brakes, and it's a rainy night, but he's able to stop. But it, like, stops right in front of him. So for a moment, Derenberger is sitting in his car. Remember in Jurassic Park when they're in the cars, when you first see the T-Rex and there's the rain? Mm-hmm. I just imagine that sound of a... There's something oh, about... Yeah, like, 
there's something about the sound when you're sitting in a car in a yeah. car that's not moving and there's rain. Yes. It's this it's this weird feeling. So imagine that feeling that tap 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 mm-hmm. and you're sitting there in your car. <gasps> His jaws dropped, his eyes are, but he's looking at this thing that's literally just parked right in front of him. Because, I mean, what do you do? Do you stay in the car and just sit and wait? Do you try to drive away? Do you get out of the car? Like, I don't know what, what is the protocol here? You know, I, it's like, right. I'm sure you're just completely shocked. So he's looking, he can see the craft through the pouring rain. And that's when he noticed some movement. And Derenberger watched in amazement as a figure began to emerge from the craft. He was very tall, once again at least six feet, at the very least. His complexion was dark, and his eyes seemed to be elongated, is how he described him. And of course, across his face was a big, unnatural grin. Oh, fuck. Now, something to note, though. The clothes this grinning man was wearing, according to Derenberger, he was wearing a dark coat and blue trousers. Okay. Even though it's not green like the one the boys saw, it, these clothes that Derenberger saw, they were also sh- bright, shimmery. Okay. Like they were, had this reflective quality. Interesting to note. So who knows if it's because one was blue, one was green. Maybe one of them just didn't get a good look and right. it was the same. You know, blue and green can look alike. Oh, for sure. Especially Definitely. at night, you know. But Or it could be something else. I have a theory about it I'll talk about later. Well, but. also, maybe they changed clothes, you know. Maybe they did a little costume change. Maybe right. there's more than one. Absolutely. I mean, what the actual hell? So Darren Berger is sitting in his car. He's in shock. And he's watching this strange being when all of a sudden it begins to approach the car. No. Shut it down. Darren Berger is horrified, and he watches this man approach. He's getting closer and closer, and Darren Berger's just, like, frozen in fear. And he makes his way to the driver's side door. And it said the strange man, he had his arms crossed across his chest with the hands appeared to be tucked under his armpits. Mm-hmm. And, of course, that smile. Oh, fuck. The figure got to the driver's side door and stood there, and then it bent down and looked in at him. <gasps> and he looked it right in the eyes, this big smile. And that's when Derenberger heard a voice. But according to Derenberger, never once did this thing move its mouth. Oh my God. It was like it was communicating to him via telepathy. And even though Derenberger had no experience with this, it was like all of a sudden he could communicate back too. He just like, mm. almost like the shine, he just kind of knew it, yeah, how to you, do it. Right, right. The grinning man asked Derenberger to roll down his window, which he did. And according to the source, their conversation was rather brief. But the strange man told Derenberger that his name was Indrid Cold. Oh. My. F***. Yep. That, okay, you guys. Some of you might know, might be already really jazzed hearing that name, and some of you don't know what that name means. And both are really, you're, I'm excited for both sides because you're, it's going to be fun for both of you. This is so cool. And Indrid Cold, he told Derenberger that he was from a country much less powerful than the United States. He asked Derenberger simple questions about who he was, where he was going, etc., so he said a much less powerful country? That's that's a weird thing, too. That That's also weird. A much less powerful country. Huh. I and wonder if he was just, like, trying to put him at ease or something. Yeah. Huh. And before leaving, Cold told him that he would return, and then it says he just got onto his craft and rocketed away. Wow, that's so weird. Okay, yes, I'm so, I can't wait to find out more. This is, this is cool. After that night, Darren Berger's life was never the same. Within a year of that night, he had gotten a divorce from his wife. (gasps) He changed his job and addresses several times, as well as having several unlisted phone numbers. Damn. It really, like, affected him. Yeah. That completely changes your whole concept of reality. What is real? What just happened to me? Oh, yeah. I, I completely understand why when people experience some of these things that, like, their life shatters. Well, yeah, like, it's almost I, like you got to be a new person now because that it's, yeah. it's weird. Yeah. In December of 1967, Darren Berger moved to another state and he laid low for a while, but he actually married another woman who was herself apparently a contactee, someone who had, oh. had contact with aliens. Oh, now, God bless. The source, meant, it doesn't go into, it literally just says this and it doesn't go into any explanation, but it just says that the woman he married was several years his junior. Oh, <laughs> I don't come know on. what that means. Right. Watch it be like right. she was just three years younger than him. Right. But it's, yeah, no, it was, it was probably substantial. 
Well, at his new home, where he lived, it was often reported that there would be strange lights that seemed to almost hover above Darren Berger's home. Oh, weird. And it wasn't just Darren Berger who reported this, but other people in the area as well. Darren Berger always said that it was injured cold in his spaceship projecting those lights above his house. Weird. Not only that, this was interesting too. Darren Berger claimed that injured cold and his friends would come visit him often. And when they did, oftentimes they were driving a car. Just like a normal car? Like a car. Like they just pull up in a car, which I found is weird. Like this is the weirdest alien I've ever heard of, if it's even that. Well, it's like, do they just sometimes come here and and live like a normal human life? And did he look the same every time he would visit him? I'm guessing so, yes. Like that That like big, weird smile. And it doesn't go into detail about his friends, if they all look alike, if they're... Right. Yeah. And here's another interesting fact. Darren Berger even agreed to extensive physical and psychiatric tests. A month later, the psychiatrist who had been working with him claimed to have been contacted as well. Whoa, that's weird. Yeah. Over the years, being visited by Cold and his friends, Darren Berger claimed to have learned some interesting stuff about who these beings were and where they were from. Apparently, they told him that they were from a planet called Lanulos which was part of a galaxy called Genomedes. Okay, citizens of the Genomedes. There you go. Okay. Darren Berger said he has even visited their home planet a number of times and visited a number of cities that were on this planet. Whoa, that's a huge deal. So he's saying he himself has gone to other planets. Oh yeah. Okay, so this is this is big. Okay, this is okay. And he said the people there all wore colorful shorts. <laughs> And that they're okay. they're writing, like when he would see posters, billboards, they're writing, he said it had similarities almost to like certain Asian languages. Okay. I'm assuming it wasn't any of those, but it had it like just like similarities. reminded him of them. Right. Yeah. Uh, huh. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And the do. colorful shorts. And the colorful shorts. Okay. That's kind of really piqued my interest. Oh, I would yeah. love to know some more about the fashion, but we'll see what we can find out. Well, also remember in Hellier, they go and visit Darren Berger's daughter. Yeah, that, that if you want to do it, a deep dive into Indrid Cold. That's a great series. Oh, yeah. Especially season two. Goes more into Indrid Cold, I think. Well, not far away from where Darren Berger had had his encounter was the town of Point Pleasant, West Virginia. Oh, my God. Uh, okay. okay, okay, okay. About seven miles north of that town, there was what the source describes as an expansive World War II and munition dump. The locals referred to it as a TNT area. And this area, it said, was several hundred acres of wooded area. And then there would be these big, like, cement domes mm-hmm. hidden in them where they would, you know, keep all these this stuff. Well, this area, as you can imagine, was not heavily populated. But starting around the summer of 1966, people started to see strange things in the sky and in the woods. Now, you remember at the beginning of the show, we said the Grinning Man's often associated with things like Mothman, Shadow People, yes. all that stuff. Well, many may know that Point Pleasant, West Virginia, was the site of the Silver Bridge collapse mm-hmm. in December of 1967. That's right. And this is a tragedy where 46 people died and everything. And, and this re- that really happened. Right. And this is something that is often associated with the Mothman mm-hmm. or Idrid Cold. I was expecting you to say when you were like, it's kind of connected or right. similar to the Mothman, I thought it was just going to be kind of like tangentially. Oh, But no, it's yeah. like, no, literally Injured Cold is like a central character oh, of yeah. that story. It sounds like he might be the Grinning Man. Right. Maybe they're one in the same. So, wow, that's crazy. Because some people say when they talk about Injured Cold, they don't describe him looking like this, like looking like the Grinning Man. Right. So that's interesting. So maybe they have kind of like they can transform in some way or maybe like they just can kind of present themselves as looking a certain way to us. You know, who knows? Maybe he's able to look all sorts of different ways. Right. Well, one family that lived in this area of Point Pleasant near the TNT area was the Lilly family. Uh, which consisted of James Lilly, who worked as a riverboat captain on the Ohio River, his wife, and their children. 
Now, they had all witnessed all sorts of strange activity at their home, which was on Camp Connolly Road, which is just south of this TNT area. Mm -hmm. So get ready for some big-time Skinwalker Ranch vibes. Whoa, okay. It was March of 1967 when the family began to notice strange low-flying lights in the sky around their home. But the family actually kept the sightings to themselves for the first few weeks as they didn't want anyone to think they were nuts. But James Lilly was quoted saying this. It didn't take us long to learn that when our TV started acting up, it was a sure sign that one of those lights was passing over. I didn't think much of all the flying saucer talk until I started seeing them myself. You've got to believe your own eyes. Wow. Yeah, here are those weird orbs of light freaking flying around. Oh, yeah. Likewise, cars that were driving in the area would suddenly just, like, stall without any, you know, reason why. Right. And by the next month in April, word had gotten around that this TNT area was a hot spot for UFO activity. So night after night, carloads of teens and adults, they would just go down to Camp Connolly Road and hope to get a glimpse of these things. And the source says that almost everyone went home happy, including policemen, news reporters, and even the Mason County Sheriff George Johnson. Wow. Wow. Claim to have seen something. Wow, that's great. That is a that's a fucking big deal. Our Mrs. Lily had this to say. We've seen all kinds of things. Blue lights, green ones, red ones, things that change color. Some of them have been so low that we thought we could see diamond-shaped windows in them, and none of them make any noise at all. Weird. Very skinwalker. Yes, the this is so bizarre. Green, red, blue lights, they don't make any sound. Wow, anytime I think or I hear about any just weird lights, like I, I know that sounds so vague, but it's like I think we just humans at this point don't really have words to describe the kind of light that they're right. seeing. Exactly. So it's interesting hearing about the weird light and then oh, no yeah. and then sound not really coinciding with it. Right. Because we, we don't we can't really imagine anything moving like that in the air and so quickly without making any kind of noise. Exactly. Now, much like Skinwalker Ranch, things began to happen around the Lily's home that folks would probably wouldn't usually associate with UFOs. In fall of 1996, it was as if their home suddenly became haunted. Okay, what the fuck? They would hear cabinet doors slamming at night as well as other strange noises, perhaps most terrifying, was that the Lilies began to hear what sounded like a baby crying. <gasps> even though there were no babies around. That reminds me so much of Skinwalker Ranch with this yes. poltergeist activity. And there have been other episodes where we've talked about before too. I can't, there's so many, my head is just going, going, going right now. But like the idea where it's like the poltergeist activity going along with right. with the UFO activity. And it right. like makes you think that everything is connected. And it's like, maybe it's more about interdimensional right. things rather than traveling to like light years away. Very you true, know? Right. Oh, it's so weird. Mrs. Lily said, it sounded so plain that I looked around the house, even though I knew there was no baby here. It seemed to come from the living room, only a few feet away from me. That's so scary. How <gasps> skinwalker is that? Wow. How skinwalker? Like, that is so skinwalker ranch. It, that is so skinwalker ranch, and also a lot of hearing a baby crying. Right. Like, that's a thing with... I think Skinwalkers. And do you remember that thing on Skinwalker Ranch The she saw with her binoculars, there was like a, an RV or a trailer out on their property and she saw like a very tall person. <gasps> Stay, remember that? Yeah. Oh my God. This is freaking me out. But my stomach feels weird. Oh God. It's like when you hear all of these things together and all, it just kind of like oh, yeah. shakes you a little bit, even though you're not experiencing this. Right. It's like kind of shakes your perception of reality too. You're like, what? This is so weird. It's that so weird. So many multiple people people over so like different years have described so many similar things oh it's bizarre well the family's daughter-in-law doris lily she lived not far away on the south end of point pleasant in march of 1967 strange shit began to happen for her as well every night at around 5 p.m doris would get a phone call but whoever was on the other end she had no idea there was a voice on the other end, but it didn't sound like any person she'd ever met. The source describes the voice as a sort of bizarre metallic sound that spoke in a rushed, garbled tone. What? And it was like it was speaking a language she didn't know. Oh, that's it, so creepy. I hate that. The calls would only come in when she was alone. It was as if whoever was doing it knew she was alone. 
this would happen night after night until she even had the phone company come out. They looked at everything, couldn't figure out what was going on. Yeah, horrifying. Oh my God, I hate that. When John Keel and his team, when they were interviewing the, Le- the Lily family, he asked a question that sort of struck a nerve. He asked if any of them had ever dreamt that there was a stranger in the house in the middle of the night. After hearing this, Mrs. Lily nudged their 16-year-old daughter, Linda, and asked that she share the nightmare she had had that March. Oh, no. At first, she really didn't want to share, but she finally did. She told the investigators that one night she woke up, and there standing at the end of the bed was a tall figure looking down at her. She couldn't really make out his face except for one thing, a big, unnatural grin. Oh, you guys, I can't with this shit. So this grinning man, Mm -hmm. injured cold or someone else or who fucking knows, was watching her sleep and she's a teenager. Well, she's horrified. Linda screams. Mrs. Lily was in her bedroom alone because Mr. Lily was away at work on the river. She heard Linda scream that there was a man in her room. Oh, my God. Could you think of a worse scenario to wake up to? But Mrs. Lily just called back saying she was fine. She's just having a nightmare. (sighs) But Linda wasn't. The strange grinning man then began to walk around the side of the bed toward Linda until he stood directly over her, looking down at her with that grin. I, oh, my God. Linda screamed, throwing the covers over her head. And when she looked again a moment later, he was gone. Linda then sprinted in a flash to her mother's room, screaming that there really was a man in the room. And Mrs. Lily believed her too, because the moment she heard her scream a second time, she knew that there was someone in there. And uh, Linda refused to sleep alone since that encounter. Oh my God, that is fucking horrifying. And it sounds like kind of like the hat man or a shadow person. Exactly, right? Then that yes. now that sounds like a, like we're getting into hat man territory. Yes. And also kind of the fear bong idea. Exactly. Like maybe this thing needed to scare her to get energy to do whatever, whatever. the hell it right. do whatever it does in its free time. I don't know, do a sudoku or some shit. Bullshit. Could you just get energy somewhere? Just have a snack like the rest of us. Yeah, take a B12, asshole. Eat a fucking granola bar. God damn it. When they asked Linda for a detailed description of the man, an interesting thing she noted was that the figure was wearing a checkered shirt. And here's something I had no idea about, but I found it interesting. This is a direct quote from the source. Occult literature is filled with references to ghosts wearing checkered shirts, but the occultists tend to skip over this seemingly irrelevant detail. Oh. Interesting. I've never even heard that before. We'll have to dig a little more into that. I wanted to add that because I thought that was Very weird. Huh, okay. Now I'm going to share with you a story that utterly creeped me out. Oh my God. This was originally posted. It was on like a creepy postum forum on Reddit. uh, And it's credited, like I said, to a user, Reddit user named Blue underscore title. The name of the story is The Smiling Man. Oh oh no. I'm assuming it's related to The Grinning Man, but if not, it's pretty damn close and it's horrifying. I'm excited to read this story because like you said, is it the exact same thing as the grinning man? Who know? You know, whatever. We don't know. Right. But that's the whole point about the grinning man is that we don't know who he is. Is it injured cold? Is it a bunch of different people? Is it like a race of people? Is it a cryptid? Is it an alien? Is it a demon? I mean, what? Fucking buffet of weird. Yes. Oh, God damn it. About five years ago, I lived downtown in a major city in the U.S., I've always been a night person, so I would often find myself bored after my roommate, who was decidedly not a night person, went to sleep. To pass the time, I used to go for long walks and spend the time thinking. I spent four years like that, walking alone at night, and never once had a reason to feel afraid. I always used to joke with my roommate that even the drug dealers in the city were polite. But all of that changed in just a few minutes one evening. It was a Wednesday. Somewhere between one and two in the morning, and I was walking near a police patrolled park quite a ways from my apartment. It was a quiet night, even for a weeknight. Very little traffic and almost no one on foot. The park, as it was most nights, was completely empty. I turned down a short side street in order to loop back to my apartment when I first noticed him. At the far end of the street, on my side, was the silhouette of a man dancing. It was a strange dance, similar to a waltz, 
but he finished each box with an odd forward stride. I guess you could say he was dance-walking, headed straight for me. Deciding he was probably drunk, I stepped as close as I could to the road to give him the majority of the sidewalk to pass me by. The closer he got, the more I realized how gracefully he was moving. He was very tall and lanky and wearing an old suit. He danced closer still until I could make out his face. His eyes were open, wide, and wild, head tilted back slightly, looking off at the sky. His mouth was formed in a painfully wide cartoon of a smile. Between the eyes and the smile, I decided to cross the street before he danced any closer. I took my eyes off of him to cross the empty street, and as I reached the other side, I glanced back and then stopped dead in my tracks. He had stopped dancing and was standing with one foot in the street, perfectly parallel to me. He was facing me but still looking skyward, smile still wide on his lips. I was completely and utterly unnerved by this. I started walking again but kept my eyes on the man. He didn't move. Once I had put about a half a block between us, I turned away from him for a moment to watch the sidewalk in front of me. The street and sidewalk ahead of me were completely empty. Still unnerved, I looked back to where he had been standing to find him gone. For the briefest of moments, I felt relieved until I noticed him. He had crossed the street and was now slightly crouched down. I couldn't tell for sure due to the distance and the shadows, but I was certain he was facing me. I had looked away from him for no more than ten seconds, so it was clear that he had moved fast. I was so shocked that I stood there for a time just staring at him, and then he started moving toward me again. He took giant, exaggerated, tiptoe steps, as if he were a cartoon character sneaking up on someone, except he was moving very, very quickly. I'd like to say at this point I ran away or pulled out my pepper spray or my cell phone or anything like that, but I I didn't. I just stood there completely frozen as the smiling man crept toward me. And then he stopped again, about a car's length away from me, still smiling his smile, still looking to the sky. When I finally found my voice, I blurted out the first thing that came to mind. What I meant to ask was, what do you want? In an angry, commanding tone, what came out was a whimper. Regardless of whether or not humans can smell fear, they can certainly hear it. And I heard it in my voice, and that only made me more afraid. But he didn't react to it at all. He just stood there smiling. And then after what felt like forever, he turned around very slowly and started dance walking away, just like that. Not wanting to turn my back to him again, I just watched him go until he was far enough away to almost be out of sight. And then I realized something. He wasn't moving away anymore, nor was he dancing. I watched in horror as the distant shape of him grew larger and larger. He was coming back my way, and this time, he was running. I ran too. I ran until I was off the side of the road and back onto a better lit road with sparse traffic. Looking behind me then, he was nowhere to be found. The rest of my way home, I kept glancing over my shoulder, always expecting to see his stupid smile, but he was never there. I lived in that city for six months after that night, and I never went out for another walk. There was something about his face that always haunted me. He didn't look drunk. He didn't look high. He looked completely and utterly insane. And that's a very, very scary thing to see. Wow, right? That is chilling. Horrifying. That is so fucking scary. The thought to me, the the idea of the like super happy kind of cartoonishness yeah. along with the possibility of violence or something is so so scary to absolutely me. and i think that it kind of reminds me almost of like pennywise a little bit from it right you know right. that kind of a feeling where it's like overdoing being friendly quote right quote you know it's like so so eerie i oh god that's scary right so i want to know what you think what 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 do you think is going on because remember the first boys they saw someone in green and then Darren Burger saw someone in blue and that person was they said their name was Indrid Cold Mm -hmm. what if the green person the green man was evil and Indrid Cold is like a space policeman coming to look for him oh 
Oh, interesting. Maybe maybe he was like looking for this like other thing that looks kind of like him, but it's like right. a- Right. That is interesting because other accounts of Indrid Cold kind of mention him as being, having some kind of like role or status in like right. his society. And like- Right has some kind of like goal right what he's going for or something or in like something almost maybe like military right related is like kind of implied right not it, not it, so necessarily in this story but in other injured cold stories so that could make sense but you, you know like with the silver bridge collapse obviously injured cold the mothman there's kind of a few schools of thought some say that he's responsible for it and others say that he was actually there to like warn people right right so it would be interesting if like the green man's evil and the blue man is trying right. to catch him in a weird way you know what i mean yeah the thing about the grinning man standing right above linda's bed yeah that that Horrifying. is so scary and it's like what is the point of that and then it just disappeared right away it, it almost that does really make me think like maybe there is something to this idea of they need to draw energy off of our fear right, right. For, you know for some reason it, it just that's what does it I used to do, like scare myself looking in the mirror and like oh, making yeah. my eyes really big me and too yeah, yeah. and I don't really know why I did that because I hated it right no it's, um, yeah. I hated doing it but then I, I would do it and maybe that was like a just a little foreshadowing to me right. with the, doing this dang podcast. Right. Well, that's going to wrap us up for The Grinning Man. Wow. Dylan, thank you for... I got to say, this is, I think, one of the scarier, the scariest episodes we've done in, recently. It's freaky, right? This is fucking... Sc- it's unsettling. It's really, it could be anything. Cryptid, supernatural, you know, UFO. But definitely related to at least like other beings. Right. Other intelligent yeah. life of some kind. It's a little, it's a little bit of everything. It's fascinating. And it's oh, sort God. of a prologue to the Mothman story. Yes. It is. It's kind of like a prologue. And if you don't know about the Mothman or the Mothman prophecies or the Silver Bridge Collapse, right. don't worry about it. We're going to do at least an episode about it and probably more. But Dylan, thank you so much for doing all of that great work. Of course. Well, it's now I get to do my favorite part. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, whoa. Wow. Okay. Let's hear it. Ladies and gentlemen, the names of our top tier Patreon subscribers, of course, the Dream James Watkins. The Finnish Face via Alunkfist, the Madman Marcus Hall, the Vivacious Vicky McHugh, the Tenacious Teresa Hackworth, the Heartbreak Kid Chris Hackworth, the Oh So Suave Sean Richardson, the British Bone Breaker Bex Martin, the Notorious Nicholas Barker, the Terrifying Taylor Lashmet, the Count of Cool Cameron Corliss, the Archduke of Attitude Adam Archer, the Sinister Sam Kiker, the Nightmare of New Zealand Noeline Vivilli, the loathsome Johnny Love, and the carnivorous Kevin Bogey. Wow, wow, wow. Thank you for yes, listing yes, yes, off yes, yes. those righteous names. Of you course. know I love it. If you want to join that wonderful, wonderful squad or any tiers on our Patreon page, feel free to go over to patreon.com oh, slash yeah. Street podcast for that extra content. Citizens of the Milky Way, my name is Dylan Hackworth. I'm Maureen Bogey. A good night and goodbye.